Hi, I'm Jane Mayer, and I'm the Chief Washington Correspondent for The New Yorker magazine. Hi, I'm Julie K. Brown, and I am an investigative reporter for the Miami Herald. So, Julie, um, first of all, I am incredibly honored to be here with you today um, and to be um, sharing the same award that you are today, um, the Freedom of the Press Award. And um, I, the first thing that strikes me is how unusual it is that there are so many women who are being honored by the Reporters Committee um, this year and how different that is from at least when I started journalism many years ago. And it makes it an extra special feeling treat. Um, your work um, has been trailblazing for years. Um, you've revealed inequities in the criminal justice system for quite some time, uh, but nothing quite blew the lid off of how different the rich and the poor are treated in our legal system, I think, than quite like your reporting on Jeffrey Epstein, both the series you did for the Miami Herald and the recent book that you've done, Perversion of Justice. Um, People have been crediting your book with uh, reopening the, the entire case against Epstein 10 years after he got off almost scot-free. Um, the reporting that you've done resulted in the um, uh, Trump's labor secretary having to resign. He had been the US attorney during the time when a secret plea deal was struck with Epstein um, that really looked pretty disgraceful in, in retrospect. Um, the work you've done has resulted in millions of dollars in um, uh, awards to the victims of Epstein, and um, there have been, you know, many other repercussions as well. And meanwhile, you've you've won two Polk Awards, which are two of the highest honors in uh, you can get in American journalism. And people have called you dogged and a badass and um, the Columbia Journalism Review tweeted when, when Epstein was sentenced the second time um, that they, they tweeted that this is what happens when a great reporter refuses to give up. And even the US attorney in, in New York, Jeffrey Berman the, from the federal, the, from the Southern District of New York um, uh, sang your praises saying that your reporting your excellent investigative journalism had been a great uh, help to his team as they took up this case. So, so congratulations, and um, this is well deserved. And I guess I wonder if the you know the the, the legal people are singing your praises now. Um, but were they always such a big help to you? Was there much of a behind the scenes struggle to get this story, and how much of it involved? Um, struggling with the legal system and getting help from the legal system? Well, this story was about 10, at least 10, almost 15 years old when I started to uh, look at it. And I decided that the best way or the only way really to figure out, uh, this seemed like such a miscarriage of justice. And none of the stories that I read seemed to tell me how and why it happened. So I decided I would just start from scratch, just ask for all the records I could get my hands on. And of course, one of the first things that happens is because the case is so old, they say they can't find the records, you know? And uh, one of the tricks I've learned, I'm sure Jane, you know how to do this. You ask for it and then you get what you get and then you wait a little while and then you find something else and you realize they didn't give you everything. So then you put another request in and you have to be relentless on the public records request because a lot of times the records that they give you the first time around are not the, all the records that there were. So a lot of it was just chasing uh, files because they were quite old and making them go into, you know, warehouses. And even the lawyers themselves who were involved in the case didn't have all the files handy and didn't remember all the details. So I had to really go back and look at everything, every case, every uh, police report, uh, just everything that I could get my hands on. And uh, I think the biggest uh, obstacle that uh, I faced with this was that a lot of the documents were redacted and sealed. And so you have to really figure out a way to uh, convince people to either leak you the documents anyway, which I wasn't very successful in the beginning. And uh, the redactions were mostly of underage girls. 
So, the, you know, I wasn't going to be able to get around that. And I think that, that, that what helped with that was, again, I just read all the documents and, you know, inevitably they leave a name here or there that you have to, you know, you can kind of put the, all the pieces of the puzzle together. So those were some of the obstacles, but the unsealing of, you know, the Miami Herald, we early on um, filed a motion, which turned into really a lawsuit in federal court in New York to unseal a whole lot of documents that we know knew were important in New York. It was a case involving one of the victims and Gila Maxwell, who of course um, most people know is now facing sex trafficking charges in, uh, in New York in connection with Jeffrey Epstein's uh, sex trafficking operation. So we, uh, you know, we filed a lawsuit essentially to get them to unseal that. And uh, it was quite, you know, uh, uh, a rewarding moment when I watched our lawyer, Sandy Bohr, argue before the uh, Circuit Court of Appeals to unseal these on behalf of, you know, the First Amendment, on behalf of the public, which deserved to know the circumstances behind this deal. Um, I mean, it just really gave, I have to say, gave me goosebumps to listen to his appeal and, and how important um, it was for us as a newspaper and also uh, the public to really understand uh, the roots of this case. That's an amazing story. I mean, the, the just even looking for the, um, the fine details of a, a, a mistaken name left in a redacted um, document makes me think of what Robert Caro writes about how the, his advice to reporters is read every single word but it also sounds like the advice is get some great lawyers if you're at, at, a, at a newspaper I mean did you feel that um, you were up against much in the way of um, a, a, a powerful legal team on the other side and did you ever feel endangered in any way taking on um, not just those lawyers but but Epstein and the sort of powerful people that um, he was uh, the circle that he was traveling in? We, uh, we were told, uh, Emily Michaud was my uh, visual journalist, uh, photographer, videographer who worked on this project with me. And we were told by numerous people that we approached, um, you know, law enforcement people that worked on the case, that we had better be careful because we didn't know what we were really up against. That, that, some of these very people who we were trying to uh, pry information out of had been, you know, had been followed and intimidated over the years. And to some degree, uh, in some respects, it had destroyed their careers. So we were very mindful of this. And because of that, I was very, very careful with what, who I called and, uh, you know, how I, I, you know, I didn't, tell people everything I was doing from the get-go. I mean, the people that needed to know the most, which were the, the victims I knew were cooperating and their immediate attorneys, they knew. But uh, there were very few people that really knew what we were doing until the very end, because I was concerned that these people would go after these women after all these years, if they found out that they were finally uh, talking to us and, and going public, I was concerned that, that Epstein or maybe people working on behalf of him would go back and, and go after these women again. And I didn't want that to happen. It's, it's, it's always great to be underestimated, I think, by the, the people you're reporting on so that they don't see quite the full picture of, of, of what you're getting. Um, how important do you think it was in talking to um, the victims to be able to tell them that they would be legally protected since this is, you know, we're talking about the reporters committee for the freedom of the press and, and the importance of, of lawyers in helping reporters. I, I, I personally have found it often very helpful to be able to say, I've got the best lawyers in the world working with me and, and they will help protect you. But did, were you able to say that to the victims that you were trying to get speak to you? And if so, did it make a difference or, or what kinds of techniques did you use to get them to talk to you? Well, in fact, um, the one victim, uh, her lawyer told her not to talk to us. Uh, to, Is that right? Uh-huh. And uh, she, uh, against his wishes, 
did decide to, to talk to us. And just to fast forward until after the series rain, that lawyer then called me back and said he was so grateful that, that she ignored him. Thanks but uh, yeah, right. Uh, look, uh, these women, they were in a category uh, that they were so, um, you know, betrayed by everyone in this system, you know, in some cases, even by their own lawyers, that there was nothing that I was going to really say about our lawyers being able to, you know, back us up. Uh, I don't think that even if I had said that, uh, I don't think that they would have believed it because they were very skeptical, um, um, understandably skeptical about, uh, you know, what this was going to mean and why they should do it. In fact, I contacted, I, you know, I reached out to at least 60 women and I only got four to talk to me. And I was told by a couple of the attorneys representing the other women that, that that's exactly, they didn't feel that they were protected. They didn't feel that this was going to, this was going to uproot their lives all over again. So I was, you know, at first I was very disappointed that I could only get four women to go on the record. Uh, but in some respects, I think it was more powerful that there were four women because I was able to tell more of their story and that's what people didn't really understand. So it, it's kind of funny the way that it worked it, it worked out well, given the fact that, that we had so many um, obstacles in the way of, you know, that they were afraid that their lawyers advised them not to talk. I mean, I got nasty letters from their lawyers saying, if you con don't ever contact my client again, that kind of thing. So um, I think that, um, you know, my goal was to get them essentially to trust me that, that this was a story that I felt uh, was needed to be told because their voices were always uh, silenced in this whole um, scandal and this whole criminal case. So that they were the ones that were sort of um, told to be quiet and not talk. And, and so it took a little bit of, I think, explaining to them what we were trying to accomplish that, that made them realize, and their lawyers as well, realize that this was time. This was the time. This was the time. And by the way, I started this project before the meeting to movement happened. So a lot of these conversations went on before Harvey Weinstein and, um, and uh, Larry Nasser, uh, but it happened in the middle of it, of my project. So I certainly uh, feel like I benefited in the end that, that we had this cultural awakening happening. But in the beginning, that wasn't the case. And, and it, it sounds like Epstein really picked on women in particular, young women, who really were the kinds of people no one would listen to almost deliberately so that it would you know no one would believe them i mean and 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 how did you manage to get them to believe you well you know i come from kind of a scrappy background myself you know um you know a single mother with three kids you know moved out of the house since i when i was 16 and you know, I never really, I, you know, I've been doing this work for so long, I don't really think about it like that. But I think that I have a different kind of, I don't know, a way of pro approaching people that I can re really relate to. These uh, young women could have been me, you know, at any moment. I was just fortunate that I didn't go down <laughs> a path like that, but I could have very well done that. I was very keenly aware of that. And, you know, even a simple thing like talking to their one of their mothers, and she was telling me the struggle that she had trying to keep food on the table. And I remembered my mother, you know, making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for, you know, so I could, there were details, I guess, that I could pick up that I thought explained um, a little bit more to people how, um, you know, what a betrayal this was because these were 13 and 14 year old girls who, you know, you know, I don't, know if many people remember when you were 13 and 14, but you don't always make the best decisions. And imagine if you have no parental role at home, your parents are on drugs and, and you have, as one girl told me, you, all I can remember was I was wearing the same pair of shoes for three years and they were too tight. And I thought if I went and got the, gave this man a massage, I could finally buy a new pair of shoes. And details like that are, you know, they were so important, I think, to making the public understand the, the real serious horror of this story. And those kind of details just weren't reported before. 
Do you feel like the whole story now has come out given that, um, as we know, Epstein died while in custody under sort of, uh, sort of questionable circumstances? Do we know the whole story still of, of yet of um, the size of his crimes and, and, and what happened to him in the end? No. No, we, we don't, we know very little. Um, and, you know, you have to wonder why, why it's such a high profile case. It's been, uh, you know, two years now and the, uh, you know, DOJ um, and the federal government has, has launched like they, a couple of different um, investigations. We still don't know the result of those investigations two years later. Uh, there are so many unanswered questions you know, these two guards who fell asleep on the job, uh, you know, now just took a plea deal that now is sealed. So that's another problem that it's a recurring problem with this case in that things are done behind the scenes and the public is never, never learns why or how it happens. And I think that's what makes uh, lawyers uh, who who help the media is so important. I know that, uh, for example, a lot of the things that are going on right now with the Gielan Maxwell case, they're trying to seal, and our lawyers have been watching it very carefully, and you know, you know, objecting because that's what the problem was with the case before. There weren't the media wasn't there every second paying attention to all these motions. So therefore they didn't have media attorneys saying, well, wait a minute, you can't just seal everything. You gotta provide a reason why you're doing this. So now we're on top of it, or we're trying to stay on top of it and you know, forcing um, the prosecutors and the judges and the defense attorneys to really outline why they are sealing some of these things. Jane has been one of my um, heroes in journalism that I have followed and sort of try to, to, you know, um, do the same kind of work, you know, based on all the success that she has had with, um, you know, uncovering um, so many uh, dark corners of, uh, you know, government and people who behind our government, who really have almost a shadow um, government that they um, use their money and their power and to, to get things done that nobody ever knows about unless Jane has a, or some other reporter uncovers it. I mean, the Koch brothers and all the money that they have, the dark money, the recent story that you had in uh, about, refresh my memory, what is it? The recent, the recent story you had in, about the forces behind uh, the, um, the election to nullify the election in Arizona. I, I mean, it's just, uh, can you talk a little bit about what led you to go down this particular road with finances and money? Because that to me is very, very difficult. I'm not very good at, at that angle of journalism. So I was just wondering how you started doing that. Well, I mean, it's funny. I'm not really a natural at um, reporting on, on numbers and money either. I used to be at the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I, I, you know, I was had to be dragged kicking and screaming to do spot news where we did earnings reports and things like that because I was so bad at math. Um, and so this really is, is, is to me much more a matter of following the power. Um, I'm, I'm sort of very interested in ethics and um, and corruption and power and what people do behind closed doors. And a lot of the time, if you follow the money, you follow where the power is. And that's sort of what I discovered from, from um, covering politics in Washington. I've been doing it for, for a long time. And, and you know, it, there's, a re, there's a reason why Deep Throat in the Watergate days said, follow the money. Um, it's just so important to American politics. And um, so, you know, you kind of can't avoid it, really, if you're going to really cover how power works in this country. And so, um, so I just got used to taking a closer look, turning over the rocks, um, seeing what was under them, 
um, at one point, the Kochs, um, one of their top advisors said to them, this is Charles and David Koch of the famous Koch brothers, their top advisor said, if you turn over every rock in recent years in American politics, you're going to find us underneath it. And, and, and to a surprising extent, it seemed to be kind of true. I mean, I got into that story because I was covering the Tea Party uprising when Obama was president. And, and, and what I noticed was that after going to various rallies that they had the same signs, the same slogans, uh, the same behavior of, of sort of constituents screaming at their elected representatives about the same issues in the same ways. And I began to wonder, is there some kind of organization behind this? And so I started looking and um, it didn't take very long to realize that there were a few major national organizations and, and one of them was called Americans for Prosperity. And I just signed up under my own name to go to one of their conventions down in Texas. And I went there and the, the Koch people had been telling me, their various sort of public relations people, that they had no role in the Tea Party. And I got down to this convention of an organization that they basically founded and funded. And everybody with their, they were all Tea Party operatives being trained on how to disrupt the Obama administration and, and sort of bring down democratic government in the country to the extent they could. And, and if you ask the people on the ground there around me, you know, do you know the Cokes? Are they working with you? They say, oh yeah, we've been working with them for years um, and started to tell their stories. So it kind of lifted a lid off for me to see that behind the, 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 the billionaires denials, there actually were all of these veins of money in the country and that a lot of things that looked like spontaneous uprisings were actually getting funded by the same two extraordinarily wealthy brothers. Um, and so that was the beginning of that. And I, I just got to say that, um, you know, again, since we're talking about legal matters, that in so many countries around the world and in so many publications, maybe even in, in this country, it would have been very daunting, I think, for a reporter to just stumble into taking on two of the richest people in the world who are deeply embedded in American politics and deeply, deeply secretive about it. And it would have been you know, more dangerous um, if you tried to do something like this to take on oligarchs in Russia, or even if you were at a tiny publication here that could be easily intimidated or shut down, it, it would be hard. But at the New Yorker magazine, um, it was spectacular. Um, we have some of the best lawyers, First Amendment lawyers in the country working with us, um, guiding us on you know, what we can and, and, and need to be careful not to say and how to do it. We've got fantastic fact checkers who keep us from making the kinds of mistakes that might get us sued. And, um, and editors who, um, who are unintimidatable um, and, and so it was really just an, an amazing situation. And we really did run up into some serious intimidation later. I mean, the, 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 the piece came out in 2010. Um, it was not too long after that, that I learned later that the Cokes had hired a private eye um, to um, sort of run a boiler room operation to, to collect oppo research on me and to try to smear my reputation. They wanted to try to undo the story. It, the story was up for a prize um, from um, the, a national magazine award. And they were trying to smear me in advance because the magazine had nominated me. And, um, and they did their best. I mean, they, they went through my life. Luckily, it was so boring. My life was so, so, so ordinary and, and careful. I return my library books and I pay my parking tickets and, um, and, and I, you know, I'm married and have a daughter and a dog and live in the suburbs. It's really, they must have been falling asleep if they were trying to find stuff on me. And eventually they just basically kind of made it up. Um, and what they tried to do was frame me as a plagiarist. And they came close and it was really scary. Um, but what they did was they, um, they, they claimed that there were a couple phrases in four different stories over 10 years of work that were similar to other people's phrases. 
and they gave me overnight to respond to it. Um, to, they were working with two news organizations, one of which was Tucker Carlson's organization, which at the time was the Daily Caller. And um, um, I had very little time to respond, but I called up the reporters whose stories I was supposed to have plagiarized and asked them if they thought that was true. And to a, um, a man and a woman, all of them, all four of them, not only denied it, but took my side and put out public statements supporting me. And at that point, the, the whole sort of smear job boomeranged and fell apart. And, the, and, the, and I was able to actually expose it um, as kind of a, a dirty operation to bring down a reporter. Um, and it, it didn't work. And in fact, you know, it was great. The New York Post, surprisingly, um, Keith Kelly there, who covers the press, actually wrote a story called Smear Disappears. And um, it, was, it, was, it was great. He sort of followed how the coax had tried to t take me down. Um, but anyway, it was, you know, it was so, the, the, you know, that's just a sideline. And in fact, the Cokes had gone after many people. I was just one of them. And they, um, and, and much more concerning really is that they had tried to intimidate some of the sources that um, over the years who were critics of theirs, anyone who might dissent. And um, so, that, you know, that in a way is, is th those people don't necessarily have the resources that a reporter at the New Yorker or a writer for uh, Doubleday Books has. Um, and so anyway, um, lived to tell the tale. And I um, felt, you know, that, that it was a, f a fascinating study on how money corrupts American politics. And how also how American politics uh, fights back, really, uh, the power fights back against journalism. And, you know, I had a similar experience with the Epstein thing where I was accused of plagiarism. And then, of course, we had Alan Dershowitz publicly appealing on Twitter to the Pulitzer Committee to not give me the Pulitzer. And, uh, you know, it was the same kind of tactics, really, that, that you faced. I, I find that really interesting. That must be all they can grab onto. I know the Daily Caller, for example, went through every single sentence in my series in the Herald because they started calling me and uh, trying to track down where I got this and where I got that. And I got a little annoyed because I thought, why do I have to tell you where I got the information? And then they contacted my editor and they said, well, you got to tell us within 24 hours or we're going to, I don't know, they threatened something. And I thought, are you freaking kidding me? You're threatening? Oh, it's, real. I, it's a very interesting how parallel these two things are really at going after the the prizes and and trying to undercut your chance to win them and and the daily caller going after your reporting sentence for sentence which is what i was up against too in your case do you think it was because they were siding with epstein or was it that they were trying to protect protect alex acosta and the trump administration i mean what, what do you think was going on well, it, it, it's hard to say, I think, that for uh, Alan Dershowitz, who's trying to protect himself to some degree, because, you know, he's been accused of being involved in this by one of the victims. Actually, two of the victims have accused him of being involved and, and abusing them. So I think in his case, to some degree, it was uh, it, it protecting himself. But I also think that at that time, he thought he was probably doing Epstein a service because this was before he was uh, arrested uh, and charged again. So I think to some degree he was sort of trying to protect uh, Epstein. I knew he was in contact with Epstein and Epstein was very concerned, uh, you know. So I think that that was the case. And then, then the other woman was a woman who had covered the story years and years before. I had never even read anything that she wrote. And she started just writing letters to everybody, the Pulitzer Committee, my publisher, the editor, and just pulling things out and saying she took this from here, you know, and the sentence she would pull out was a sentence from a court record that I, I had, you know, wrote, but I, you know, she had it, I guess, in one of her stories, but it was from a court record. And that's the kind of tactics I think they use. I've always wondered if some of the people that were behind this were sort of went another level up, whether there were other uh, private investigators or people behind this. I'm sure the same as you, I am sure that they were digging through my life as well after this happened. I'm positive they were. It's certainly enough to make you very careful about your life. I mean, I have to say, I remember, I, I, I literally, burned um, copies of uh, drafts of my book in, in my fireplace, 
<laughs> rather than put them out in the garbage because um, some, some uh, private investigators I spoke to who had worked for the Kochs told me that they that these investigators had gone through other people's garbage for them. So you have to kind of learn to take some, some um, uh, you know, precautions when you're doing this kind of work. Yeah, I, well, I, I did have some suspicious people uh, either uh, knocking at my door. At one time, someone knock, knocked at Emily's door at her home and said, demanded to talk to me. And, and you know, her husband acted like they didn't know me, uh, but it was an uncomfortable, she had to call the police because it was an uncomfortable uh, situation where he was demanding to talk to me. So, you know, there were a lot of those kinds of weird things happening, but fortunately nothing. Um, you know, I'm here safe and sound. I was more worried about my kids, to be honest with you, than I, than I was worried about myself. I remember when my daughter was little, she had to answer the door as, as someone was ringing it, trying to serve me with a subpoena. Um, so she's now, a, she's now in her third year of law school. She's, um, maybe it even inspired her, who knows, uh, to, to figure out the legal system. Um, but I, I gave my son the same instruction because I heard that Dershowitz was, was trying to subpoena. I knew he was trying to subpoena me because he had reached out to the Herald and I was on book leave at the time. So I was warned that they were going to try to subpoena you. My son was home from college. And I said, if anybody knocks on the door and you don't know them, do not answer the door. <laughs> What's clear is that, you know, Ju Julie and I've benefited hugely from being at publications that actually have um, really sophisticated legal departments. Um, you know, no, no, no publication these days is, is completely without strain financially. Um, and, and, and legal services are in, can be incredibly expensive. But um, I at least feel like I've been very lucky. Um, and you know, what I worry about are the small publications in this country. I mean, local news is already really under pressure and, and, and in many cases disappearing. And it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's frightening to think what could happen to the need to hold people in power accountable if these small publications don't have some kind of legal resources to back them up, they it, it, what, what will happen likely is they they just won't take on these kinds of stories. Um, you know, it, it's too intimidating, and so you know that's where something like the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press comes in, um, because they provide those services free. And, and, and it's, it's, it's incredibly important, um, you know, because that kind of journalism won't happen. It just won't happen at all, unless people feel that they, they, they won't be sued out of existence for trying it. Yeah, I think even, even larger papers, you know, like the Herald, uh, re even regional papers, we are even uh, concerned about our legal costs. I mean, there have been times when we have to weigh, are we really going to take this on because this is going to cost an awful lot of money? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that there are certain records and things like that that maybe we would love to have, but we always sort of pare it down in order to not have such high legal fees. So it, it is working to some degree. I mean, in Florida, we're always praised for having this wonderful public records law. However, when uh, the governor wants to charge you $12,000 uh, for a file, uh, that is just as intimidating um, and silencing as, uh, you know, basically saying we're not going to give it to you at all. And that's basically what's happening, even in areas where the records are public. They're raising the, the you know, these fees so that the, the, so that it makes it impossible for newspapers uh, to be able to obtain the records. I have a case right now. The Herald, we're, we're trying to get some uh, state files on the Epstein case. And I got some of them, they charge us an astronomical amount of money and we wanted the rest of them and, and they want $12,000 for the rest of the records. So, uh, you know, we'll see where that goes, but that's what they do, you know? Right, definitely. I just wanna say how honored I am to be in the company of all of the rest of the winners here. Um, it's just such a stellar group of people and, you know, very inspiring to me. I agree. And, you know, this is probably one of the, 
you know, the highlights of my entire career um, being honored in this way with Jane and um, all the other honorees. This is, you know, and the fact that it's the 50th 50th anniversary of this organization that has been so important, not only to journalism, but really to democracy when you really think about it. So, um, you know, I'm really grateful for this award and thanks. Thank you, uh, Jane and uh, the Reporters Committee for uh, inviting me uh, to, to talk about my work. Well, thanks, Jane. I really enjoyed this conversation and um, I hope you continue all your good work. And um, thank you again to the Reporters Committee uh, for honoring me and, um, and let's just keep fighting because this is really important, especially right now when there's so many um, aspects of our democracy that's being threatened. I, to I totally agree, Julie. It's been great talking to you. Sometimes the best stories are the ones that um, don't get published that happened as you got the other story. And it was great to hear some of them. And, um, you know, I, 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 you and I have been um, grouped together in one story as badasses together. And it's just the ultimate compliment. And I'm so glad to share that moniker with you. And I want to just thank the Reporters Committee again um, for the tremendous work they do. And, you know, it's a, it's a small group. It's a group that grew organically out of a need. Um, reporters themselves started it. And um, I, I just, you know, can't say enough good things about it. It's, it's doing a wonderful mission in the world, and we need it more than ever.